That's so true that every single life is precious to God and he created us with a future in mind. God never created us so that we could just exist. He has a far greater purpose than we all could ever imagine. And when I look at the way the world is going and, and the direction that the world is going, it's so easy for us to forget that we're created in the image of God. We see magazines and newspapers, movies, Hollywood, different pictures that say this is how you're supposed to look. And so what the world does is it gives us an image of what we're supposed to look like, but it doesn't come with the character qualities that God wants us to have. And so we, we're so busy trying to look good on the outside that we forget that God created us in his image, not just by the way we look, but with character, with depth. And today we're going to learn that when, we're, when we understand that we're created in God's, God's image, there's power that comes with that. Now, 2017, for our church, God gave us a word, and it's change. This is our year of change. And our scripture is that he's the potter and we're the clay. And so in the year of change, there are certain things, like I come against certain walls that I, I know I need to change my attitude with or, or certain things need to change, but I hit certain walls that I refuse to change. Like I'll, I'll hit a wall and I'll say, boy, that's, that's pride right there. Or I'll hit a wall and I say, oh, that's my anger. But I don't do anything with it. And it's like God is saying, I need you to change because I'm going to do something with your life in the future. And you're going to, you, you don't need this. In fact, this is, this is not going to be needed for here. But if this stays here, you're not going to reach here. So in order for you to obtain the things that I see for your future, you're going to have to put away the things that are here in your life today that are restraining you from heading into that future. So I got to give up certain things in this year of change and change for the better, but change forever, not just change for the moment. So as I'm thinking about all of this, I'm thinking, wouldn't it be so great? I mean, I think for us, it would be so great if we could just write a list on all the things that other people need to change. Amen. It would be so easy to do that. It would be so easy for husbands to write what they need to change in their spouse in their wife. Or, or wives, you could write a list. Maybe you need a computer because there's maybe more things and you need certain memory banks so that you can write down, what does my husband need to change? Or our children. If we could write a list and write down, what do my children need to change? Or my parents. No, don't say anything, kids, because you can get grounded. So if, you, if your parents could change something and kids, if you could write something and all the children would write down, my mom needs to change this, my dad needs to change this, whatever it would be. Or someone at work. Imagine if you could write a list of things that other people needed to change. You give it to them. They receive it and say, thank you so much. I will change right now. I didn't see that in myself. I'm so thankful that you brought this to my attention. I'm, I, I'm so appreciative. Now, that would be so great if we could do that. My list would be small because Heidi, she's like, perfect. <laughs> so perfect. <laughs> There's no sarcasm in there. But it would, be, it would be so great. But what is interesting is we would love to do that for other people. But what about when it comes to ourselves? Would we dare to sit down and write a list of, okay, I, <laughs> these are the things I need to change and start writing? I mean, would we even be honest with ourselves? Would we even write down things we need to change? Or would we justify and say, oh, I need to work on my anger? But if she didn't say this, then I wouldn't get angry. If he just listened, if my children just did what I said, I wouldn't get angry. Would we, even, would we justify our own list? But here's the good news. God doesn't necessarily give us a list and say, here are the things you need to change. All he does is say, come to me and I'll take care of those things. Because you don't have the power to change yourself, even if you knew what to change you just don't have the power. You can maybe change for the moment, but you don't have the power to sustain the change. We're going to look at a story today found in the book of Matthew, chapter 22. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, I'll read it to us. This story in Matthew 22 is about some people called the Pharisees. Now, if you know a little bit about the Pharisees, they were the religious leaders who knew the laws of God but they never lived out the laws of God. In other words, the Pharisees were kind of like 
what we just talked about. They were the people who would write down lists and say, okay, this, these are the things you need to change. And they would hand those out to people, imaginary. They would say, you need to change this, change this. But for us, we don't need to change because we are the holy ones. We know God. So we, we walk around knowing God. We walk around with the scriptures. We walk around with our robes, sit at the highest places at the table because we're of God. But we don't need to change. You need to change. That, that was their attitude. So they had a problem with Jesus because Jesus was the only one who challenged them in changing on the inside. Jesus said, hang on, you, you're, you're telling everybody all these things, but you didn't even, you yourselves don't live by these standards. You know the laws of God, the ways of God, but for some reason you're not living after the things of God. So Jesus challenged them. So now this story that we're going to look at, the Pharisees, they want to trap Jesus. They want, they want to ask him a question that Jesus cannot answer or he's going to answer in a certain way and then they're going to use what he said against him. So the Pharisees, this is, this is how, uh, how, 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 as Jesus called them, whitewashed tombs. They look good on the outside but empty on the inside. This is how empty they were. They themselves didn't go to Jesus and ask this question. They sent their disciples, those who they were teaching, so like their protégés. So they said to their protégés, they go ask Jesus this question, Herod, go ask him this question. And then when he responds in this way, here's how you trap him. So we pick up in this story, Matthew chapter 22, verse 15. The Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians saying, Teacher, so now they're speaking to Jesus, the Pharisees' disciples. They say, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, tell us, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So they're waiting, and they're waiting. Now, the obvious answer is there. So Jesus responds to them. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Now, I can imagine the disciples' response, you know, just thinking, Jesus, is it, is it lawful to pay taxes or not? Because the Pharisees told us, if we ask you this question, you cannot answer this, and you're going to answer it in a wrong way, so we got you. So, Jesus, what do you say? And Jesus says, you hypocrites. Why are you trying to test me? Oh, oh no, no, we're, we're, not, we're not trying to test you, it's... It's, hey, thanks yeah, for asking us to ask this question. We're not trying to test you. You can almost sense their inability to even respond to Jesus. So Jesus continues. He doesn't even answer their question. Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Then he says, show me the tax money. Still Jesus doesn't answer them. Is it, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Well, you hypocrites, why are you testing me? Show me the coin. Still didn't answer their question. So they brought him a denarius, which was the coin, and he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, then render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And when they heard this, they marveled. They were like, oh man, we didn't even see that coming. This is a good answer. This is, why do I tell my boss, this is, this is going to be so good because they did not expect this. They marveled at his response, but then they left him and went their way. They marveled. They were in awe of what his, his response was, but then they left him and then went their way. Jesus wasn't even talking about taxes. Jesus was leading them towards something else. Something else. He was leading them towards their worth and they couldn't even see that because jesus could have answered with a quick yes it is lawful end of discussion it would have been done 
But when Jesus answers a question with a question, he's leading you somewhere. He's taking you somewhere where he knows you need to be so that you can learn something. And that's what he was doing. He was leading them somewhere. And what Jesus was proposing to them was, well, what belongs to God then? That's what he was proposing to them. Because they're saying, well, do we pay, to, pay taxes to Caesar or not? He says, well, let me see the coin. Well, whose inscription is on it? Well, Caesar's. Then render to Caesar's what is Caesar's, and then to God's what is God's. So he was, he was bringing them towards a question from them. He was trying to pull out of them their response to say, then what belongs to God? But they know what belongs to God. The normal response would be everything else. So in other words, they're, all, they're caught in their own trap. What Jesus was saying is, I'm, I'm bringing you somewhere. And Jesus didn't say these things so he could trap them. He's saying these things to give them their worth, to show them that, yes, God is supreme ruler, which the Pharisees knew. But where's God's coin? If God owned everything, everything else, then where's his coin? But they never stuck around to hear the heart of Jesus. I could only imagine if they did, they would have, they would have learned a few things See, there is power in knowing that you are created in the image of God. And so we're going to look at, at three mindsets that will help us to live in the power of being created in the image of God, which will affect every area of our life for the better. And here's the first mindset that we can learn from this, and that's to be aware of plotting and entangling. These two words, plotting and, and entangling. Plotting means to take by craft. Plotting, like you're thinking things through. You don't just pounce on something. You, you think it through. You plot it through. You, you take by craft. It's like pickpockets. They plot. They're crafty at what they do. And they steal from you, not, not just the, to take from you, but their, their craft is that they steal from you and you don't know it. And that's exactly what the enemy does, doesn't he? The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He, he wants to steal so that you don't even know it. And later down the line, you're like in life saying, oh my goodness, I didn't even see that coming. I didn't know I was going to be at this point in life or this happened. Boy, where did I go wrong? And it's like years ago, pickpocket. He's crafty. The Bible calls Satan the most craftiest. So he plots. But at the same time, he also entangles. Entangle means to trap, that he traps us. You see, the devil doesn't care how often we come to church so long as we're trapped in our own identity and in our own image, not the image of God. So he could care less what we do so long as, so long as we don't follow God and understand our worth in God and understand that we're created in his image. The dictionary defines Plotting in this way, a secret plan or scheme to accomplish some purpose, especially hostile, unlawful, or evil purpose. Plotting. That's what plotting is. It's, it's kind of like if you have children, or maybe you've done this to your parents. I've done this to my mom. And, and like they, would, they would hide somewhere. And then they would, say, they would say, Mom, come in the room. And then you're hiding in the closet. And then when mom comes in, you scare her to death. And then she scolds you, you get dirty lickings, and then you're grounded. And you're like, oh, I didn't plot that well. But you're thinking through something for a greater purpose. Plotting. You're, 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 you're planning things. You're scheming so that you can have an end result. So we got to have that mindset to be aware of plotting and scheming. And Jesus was aware. He could perceive their wickedness. Now here's a question. Can you perceive wickedness? Can you perceive when something wicked is heading your way or something wicked is trying to pull you away from God, can you perceive that? Are you aware of plotting and entanglement? Because once you're trapped, it's hard to get out of. It's very hard. That's why for some, we get into a place in life and we're saying, how do I get out of this? How, how, do I, how did I end up here? And then how do I get out of this? How do I reverse this? And you feel trapped. Now, I'm not talking about marriage, okay? Because some of you are like, I feel like that. In marriage, I trapped I cannot do nothing. I can't. But it's not that. <laughs> That's a whole different message. But this one, we're talking about trapped when it comes to the devil stealing our joy or taking our joy or us giving up our joy and forgetting that that's why he, that's why he comes 
to us. It's to rob us of everything that God wants to do. And he's crafty. Now these people, they hear the words of Jesus, they're marveled, and then they leave him, and then they went their own way. I'm wondering, how, how, could, they, how could they stand in the presence of the Son of God, hear his words, be marveled by them, and then just walk away? How, how could they not press in? What was happening in their hearts? Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Obviously, Jesus was talking about the coin, but then he continued, and, and then to God, the things that are God's. And the obvious question would be, then what is God's? It could be everything else, but that's not what Jesus was alluding to. In Genesis 1.26, we find that when God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit was thinking of us, this is what took place. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God created us in his image, and we tend to forget that. Now, I'm going to ask you a question because we started off with talking about the potter and the clay. And these pictures, uh, it shows us that we begin with just a block of clay. Now, you don't know what that's going to be, but then when you come to the final picture, what is this? Lion. I hope you said lion, because if it wasn't, then, be like, then we didn't do a good job at portraying what a lion should look like. So that's a lion. But is that actually a lion? Right, it's a piece of clay. It's the image of a lion, but you know it's a lion. So when people see us, we're not God. But people should see the image of God because we're created in his image. We're not talking about looks, eyebrows, and uh, what do you call those uh, when you pluck them? Yeah, you pluck the or uh, wax them or whatever you do. Uh, hair dye and, and making our faces look good, dressing up nicely. That's how we look. And that's going to change over time. We, we hope to stay young as possible young looking as possible, but that changes over time, so it's more than just how we look, which is a physical image. But it's more than a physical image. And did you know that you are perfectly created in the image of God? Perfectly. Perfectly. Every single human being is perfectly created in the image of God, but we're not perfect creatures. We're being perfected, but we're not going to live out life perfect because of sin. But we're perfectly created in the image of God. He creates everything perfect. You're perfectly created in the image of God. Let not the world tell you anything different. You're perfectly created in the image of God. And it's not about a look. Because God is not about looks. It's about character and depth and spirituality our relationship with him, our consistency with him and, and growing with him. See, be, being created in the image of God allows us to see our worth. Not the way the world is going. The world has one set of rules and standards and laws that says this is what you need to live by so that you're worthy. God says, huh, I already created you so you're already worthy. You already have value because I created you. Everything I create has perfect value. So you don't need to find value somewhere else or in something else. It's found in me that you're created perfectly in my image. See, being created in the image of God means that we are all morally self-determining creatures. Morally self-determining creatures because God is morally self-determining. He's, he's the moral lawgiver. That's, that's why even in our world, even if you don't believe in God, you have some morals. It's innate. It's built into us. So because we are, self, we are, we are morally self-determining creatures, we can actually use that power and go our own way and use it not for the things of God and justify whatever we want. And unless we receive Christ as our Savior, we will still live however we want, 
even though we hear the words of Jesus, are marveled by them, we will still leave his presence and go our own way because we are morally self-determining creatures. We can make decisions irregardless of what the word of God says. We can hear it, but we can still go our own way. So here's the second thing. Be cautious of images and inscriptions outside of God's. Because God will speak, but be careful. Just be cautious of images and inscriptions outside of God's. And when we talk about images and inscriptions, an image is basically the likeness of something or someone. But be cautious because it could become an idol. That's why if our hearts are hardened, we can become our own idol. But God says, no, you are to be clay, moldable, and shapeable. An inscription means words that are inscribed. So like how God inscribed the laws, the Ten Commandments, he inscribed it on stone tablets and gave it to Moses. That's what it means to be inscribed. And if we're not cautious of images and, and, and inscriptions, we're going to chase after different types of beliefs. We're going to chase after things that, that, that feed our flesh. And, and we're going to do things that shape our thinking and, and believe in things that shape our thinking that are outside of God's way. And it may almost seem like, well, you need to be open-minded then. It can't just be about the things of God. Well, we know what road that leads to. Many of us have been down that road, and so we came back to the Word of God and said, this is the best thing for me. God's way is the best way. It's not religious at all. It's super relational. It's been in this relationship with God. That's why for so many of us, we, we, will, we will say these so often, and I've said this before, you come to a season in life and you, you have to find yourself. Like we say this to ourselves, we just say, boy, this has happened, this has happened. I, I got to find myself. We even say that sometimes to one another. It's like, honey, I got to find myself. So I need some space. So just, just for a little bit, I just need to find myself. I, just, just a little while. And they're panicking like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Find yourself. You're right there. What are you talking about? No, I need to find myself. Some things I've been going through, so I need to find myself. Now, we, we've said that, and I understand what we're saying. It's like we got we to gotta gather our thoughts. We need time to process. But let's just be very cautious that, that we don't misconstrue finding ourselves and finding God. Because they both feel fundamentally the same from the beginning. But they both end up ultimately disparate they both fundamentally feel the same in the beginning i gotta find myself but is it wait no it, no i it's not about finding myself i gotta find you god because in the beginning they both feel fundamentally the same but they end up ultimately disparate in the end and so when we say god i gotta i gotta find you when you find god the bible actually tells us You'll find God when you search for him with all of your heart. So when you find God, guess who's there too? Yeah, you. So if you want to find you, find God. Because you're perfectly created in his image, in his likeness. When you find him, you'll find you. Because it's not about you. See, when we say, I need to find myself, it produces the flesh at best and it satisfies the flesh but when we say god i gotta find you then it quenches the soul it's a major difference why because there are images and inscriptions out there that we follow and then there are there are schemes that are being plotted against us to entangle us head towards god because ultimately he knows not just who we are, because that's not the question. The question is not, well, then who am I? The real question is, whose am I? That's what gives us our worth, not who am I. It's whose am I? Wait a minute. I'm created in the image of God perfectly. In fact, this is what the Israelites were dealing with when, when Moses, who led the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt, and the Israelites, being God's chosen people to represent him, 
to represent who he is so that when people saw the Israelites, they would see God in them. For those people, the Israelites, Moses had to lead them. Now Moses, he met with God. He was the one that would meet with God. God gave him instructions and then he gave them to the people. And the good thing about that was the people didn't need to go before God. Moses did on their behalf. He was like their mediator. So Moses meets with God, and while he's meeting with God, the people are waiting for Moses. When Moses comes back to let the people know what God said, he has this glow on his face. He just has this, this glow, and the people are looking at him knowing he has been with God, that our leader has been with God. But the Bible tells us this, this glory that was on Moses soon faded away, and it started to fade away. And so Moses wore a veil over himself so that the people couldn't see the glory of God fading from him. Lest they don't follow him anymore. I mean, wouldn't you want to follow someone who when you looked at them, they had the glory of God on them? Well, M Moses had that glory, but it, it was fading away. Now, that's in the Old Testament. And you fast forward to the New Testament. Old Testament is before Jesus came. And then New Testament is when Jesus was born and thereafter the resurrection. So now here you have a man by the name of Paul, the apostle, who was named Saul, but then got converted, and now he's Paul. Now he oversees churches. He's planting churches, and he's overseeing people because God uses him as an instrument to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now you have Paul here who came to know Jesus through the resurrection power of Christ. So here's Paul addressing all the different churches, and he's at this one church called Corinth, a church in Corinth, and he addresses them about this glory that God had on Moses' life. And he says this to them in 2 Corinthians 3.15. He says, yes, even today when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil. And they do not understand. But, whoever, oh, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. That's the New Living Translation. Some of your Bibles would read, we go from glory to glory, just as from the Spirit, the Lord. So Moses had the glory of God fading. But what the Bible is telling us is we are supposed to be people who goes from glory to glory. Well, how does that happen? Well, I'll put it in this way. When we were younger, we would, uh, we would get certain uh, toys that would glow in the dark, you know, like army man or stickers or, you know, things like that, football. And, and the only way it would glow in the dark, and I'm sure you know this, is how? It needed to be exposed to light because there's an element in there called phosphor, which takes in the energy of light and absorbs it. And now with that energy, it uses it to now reflect that light back. And it stays for a little while because of this chemical element. So now, because of this element, it, it can glow for a little while, but then that glow slowly fades away. And then you got to go back into the light, and then you come back out, and then it glows. Well, what happened with the law is that when God gave us the law, the Ten Commandments, we could look at the law and know what is right and wrong. It told us what was sinful? Thou shalt not. He gave us a list. When Jesus came, he came not to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill the law. In other words, Jesus said, oh, the law says you are not to commit adultery. But I say, even if you think in your mind with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Here's what Jesus did. He didn't abolish the law. He lifted us up to a higher standard of living. Why? So when people saw our lives, they could see the glory of God. That they could look at our life and say, boy, that, I, don't know, I don't know what you do in life, but all I know is there's something different about you that I have not seen in anybody else. What is it? And our simple response really is, God changed my life. 
It's just that simple. God is doing something in my life. But if we have a veil over us, and it could be any type of veil, it could be the veil of bitterness, anger, or uncontrolled anger, jealousy. It could be a veil of, of, of insecurity, unforgiveness. It could be a, a veil of jealousy or distrust. It could be any type of veil that we use that people can see and they notice it, but we put up this front so that no one can see that the glory of God is actually fading away. And so we're so good at this. We have the veil that looks so good because we don't, wanna, we don't want people to see the glory of God fading. But this is what Jesus does. He says, I came into your life to give you life so that the veil is removed so that when people see you, they see your light that shines before all men, that they would see your good works. It's there so that they could glorify me in heaven. It's not about us. It's about his perfect image that he gave to us to reflect his glory so that people find hope and healing. People are looking for that. Look in our world today. People need hope and healing. And God says, I'm going to use you as my people to shine into this world. But you got to be cautious because there's images and inscriptions all over the place. You're going to hear about things. You're going to see things written down. But if you're if you're created in my image and you go out into the world and people see you and they see my glory, it doesn't matter what happens in the world because they know that there is a God and they will find their way home because of your light shining. And this light that Jesus gives to us does not fade away. In fact, it goes from glory to glory to glory. It gets brighter and brighter and brighter because it's not us. It is his glory and not our own. We get brighter and brighter and it doesn't fade away. If you try to live life perfectly, that glow will soon fade away because it doesn't have the power to sustain you. But when Jesus is living in and through you, even with the mistakes we made, even with the mistakes we make, even with the mistakes we're going to make, because we are humble before him, because we're humble with other people, because we know how to, how to, how to ask for forgiveness or give forgiveness, because of that, his power sustains us. No longer just trying to be good and then let it fade away. Trying to be good, let it fade away. No, no, God is already good. So we just follow his lead and go from glory to glory. That's why we need Jesus. Because he's the one that sustains us. We have this, um, we mentioned it earlier, but it's called rooted and growing. It's what we use to uh, disciple uh, with, with those who are here. And, and uh, Pastor Marsha is just doing a phenomenal job with this. We have different uh, Bible studies and different uh, small groups that meet. In fact, this Thursday, we're starting the five love languages. And uh, if you're married, this is a must. It's like one of those movies that you see that you tell people, you got to see this movie. This is a must. Everyone who's married must go through, I'm not must, it's not a law, but I'm telling you, this is a great foundation for your marriage. It talks about the five love languages that we, that we have and what we need to know in each other so that we can speak each other's language. And so this Thursday, we're going to begin that in our fellowship hall. Uh, just sign up at our information center. And this is just one of the key things that we're doing. We have the Daniel plan that helps us with uh, eating healthy, but also spiritual food, how to eat spiritual food and how to eat spiritually healthy we have what we call right now media i know i'm showing you these cards you're like i can't even see that uh the reason why i show you this is because these cards are at our connecting wall in our fellowship hall and at our information center and uh, this will give you more information but right now media is the netflix for bible teaching bible studies and learning some of you cannot make it to a thursday night but you can learn at one o'clock in the morning i know because you're on facebook at one o'clock in the morning so you can put on your headphones and go on right now media you sign up and it's free it's absolutely free you just give us your email and then we send it to the company they'll give you a link and then you can you can connect our our heart is that you can be discipled anywhere anytime and anyone can be discipled and so go go check that out and, and that helps us to grow in the lord because everything out there pulls us away from him we need to have a firm foundation to grow in the Lord. And the last mindset for us is to be mindful 
of going our own way. Just to be mindful. To have that mindset to say, wait a minute, Lord, am I going your way or am I going my way? Is it my image that I'm concerned about or your image on my life? Where, where, where am I going? Where am I, where am I heading, Lord? You show me what direction. I want to trust in your word. I want to marvel at it. But I don't want to just go my own way. I want to hear what you have to say and then follow you. The other day, our grandchildren slept over and we have three grandchildren. Uh, Jaden, who's seven years old. We have a second one who's Landon and he's five. And then Oakley is three years old. So there's a, a separation from the seven-year-old to the three-year-old. And so Jaden is piggybacking his younger brother, Oakley, and going on our carpeted area and then on the tile area. So Heidi says, hey, Jaden, don't piggyback your brother on the tile because if he falls, he's going to get hurt. And so Jaden uh, calls Heidi Gigi. He says, okay, Gigi. What does he do right after? She said, right, he's on the tile again. And I see him and he's running with his brother on the tile on his back. And his brother's like, ah, you know, they're playing. They're two boys. So at one part I'm saying, it's okay. They're boys. If he falls down, he learns. But at the other side, I'm thinking, Gigi just told you. In fact, I said, I said, Jaden, Jaden. He goes, yes. I said, what did Gigi just say? He repeated exactly what she said. Repeat, exactly. He said, Gigi said, play on the carpet and don't play on the tile before he falls down and gets hurt. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah, yes. Why, now, why doesn't he listen? Because he is morally self-determining as a creature. It reminds me of God when God speaks to me and then he says, what a, what did I just tell you? <laughs> Why? Because we are, we are morally self-determining creatures. We can choose our own way. And Jesus said, if you just hung around for just a little while longer, I, I, I could have taught you a, a valuable lesson on your worth. It's not about the coin or the taxes. So then the question is, then how, so how do we hear his word, and then follow his ways. Romans 12, 2 tells us, plain and simple, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now here's why. It's not just to get a new mind and say, oh, I think differently, praise the Lord. I think differently, honey. Look, I change, honey. I different now. Look, I read the Bible. I read the Bible. Three days already I read the Bible. Just wait. I'm going to change. I'm going to change. I'm no longer going to do that anymore. I've changed. I'm a new man. I went to church twice. Don't worry, honey. We got this. We got this. I made a commitment to the Lord yesterday. I've changed. I'm a new man. I'm a new man. So we could have that mindset. I'm sorry I'm just picking on the guys, but that's kind of like reality sometimes. So I'm, we can have that mindset. But it's so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. You're perfectly created in the image of God. Never forget that. Don't let the world tell you otherwise. When you conform to this world, you lose the image of God on your life. And so now we're instructed to renew our minds so we don't go our own way, so that we may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in every area of life. He created us perfectly in his image because he can see who we're supposed to be. We can't, but he does. Just be mindful. Am I going my own way? Just ask yourself from time to time, am I going my own way? And you watch what God does. I want to close with this story in what Jesus was proposing to them and what he was alluding to. And, and Glenn, you can come to the keyboard. So the other day I'm traveling and uh, Heidi was not with me. And it was a one-day meeting. I went to Oahu, just a quick one, and then came back. So I have my laptop bag. And you know when you have your laptop, you have to take out your laptop through the screening, through security. So I'm traveling and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm finding where I need to go and, and all of these things. And, and Heidi is my navigator. You know when uh, you go traveling together? Heidi's my navigator. She helps me find wherever I need to go. Uh, she reminds me, did you get your bag? Did you grab this? Do you have your hydro flask? Uh, make sure you, you empty out the hotel room with all your things. You got this. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm not a kid. I, got, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so 
I go through the security and everything. I'm going to my, my line where the gate is for my flight back here to Hilo, and I'm feeling so good. I'm like, I don't need Heidi travel with me because I got this. I know what I'm doing. All of a sudden, I hear, Passenger Sheldon Loxina, please report to the TSA security. I'm like, did they just say my name? So I'm waiting. I'm thinking, was that me? And, and so I'm, I'm walking to my gate. This guy stands up, and you might be here today. He's like, hey, Pastor Sheldon, they're calling your name. I said, hey, who are you? I'm like, what? They said, yeah, yeah, they're calling your name. I said, oh, okay, okay. So I went to the TSA, and sure enough, they had my laptop. Yes. And so first thing comes to my mind is, I need Heidi. Second thing came to my mind was, was how did they know who was the owner? Like, how do they know? My name isn't on it. Well, when you open up the screen, there's a picture of Heidi and I, and it says, Sheldon Loxina. You know, and you have to log in. <laughs> so, and then I have a fingerprint scan on it. And so, yeah, I'm not, you know, some secret agent. It's just how the uh, laptop is. So I put my fingerprint on it, give him my ID, and he says, okay, thank you. I said, no, thank you for mentioning it to me. And I thought, that's how we know we belong to you. Your image is on us. You've given us a fingerprint that is individually made by you. And when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees' disciples, he wasn't even talking about taxes because he could have answered with a simple, yes, you pay taxes to Caesar. But when he said, what belongs to God, you give to God what belongs to God and to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. He was saying, yeah, you can give me the answer that everything belongs to God, but if God is supreme ruler, then where's his coin? And maybe the follow-up question would have, wouldn't have been, well, what belongs to God? Maybe Jesus' question to them would have been, well, whose image is on you? It had nothing to do with the coin. But it had everything to do with Jesus letting them know whose image is on you. If you render to Caesar what is Caesar's, render to God's what is God's. Well, what belongs to God? Well, whose image is on you? It's whose you are that matters most. Your value is not what you go through. Your, your value is based on whose image is on you. And that never changes because he's always the potter and we are always the clay. It's perfect that way. Would you pray with me? And bow your heads for a moment. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we are all created in your image. doesn't matter what we look like on the outside. That's, that's, that's the physical side of it. But there's so much more to being created in your image. We're created in your likeness. We're worth something. We have value because you gave it to us. That's why you could die for us on the cross because we had that much value that it costed you your son's life. And we have a future because of it. Lord, I pray for all of us today that when we leave here, that we never forget our value. No matter what people have said to us, no matter what the world labels us as, no matter what we've done, where we've been, what matters most is what you say, and you created us in your image. We are perfect in your sight because of the righteousness of your son Jesus who paid the price for all of our sins so that we could stand righteous before you. We're going from glory to glory, Lord, just as from the Spirit, the Lord. Thank you for being the potter. It's an honor to be the clay 
that has been molded and shaped in your hands. So we pray your blessing over each and every person here today. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. And we all said together, amen.